Up next, a woman is murdered in broad daylight. This is the monster jumping out of the bushes and grabbing you and killing you. Cell phone records and search dogs provided some leads. They were able to track a scent trail to a residential area that was very close to the canal trail. But if not for some crafty police work and the chance encounter, the entire investigation could have gone up in smoke. We have an individual that's still out walking about who can do this again. I don't know how much scarier it can get. During her lunch break in Concord, California, Kathy Lorick went for a walk, as she often did, along a jogging trail near her office. That was something that she just kind of did on her own as her own kind of a meditation throughout the day. I know that sometimes she would use that opportunity to, uh, you know, make some personal phone calls. Kathy was an executive secretary, married with children. On this day, she spoke with her husband, who was in Europe on a business trip. Her husband reported that suddenly she made a loud uh, a groan or a gasp, and the phone went dead. Kathy's husband knew immediately something was wrong and called her co-workers and asked them to look for her. They couldn't find her. They came back, and they called the police, and the police got there within minutes. About 20 minutes later, a police officer saw what looked like streaks of blood. The blood was like somebody had taken a paintbrush with red paint and simply drawn lines on the ground, like you see somebody just dripping paint and drawing with a paintbrush on a concrete. The officer followed the blood trail down an embankment to a heavily wooded area where he found Kathy Lorick barely alive in a pool of blood. You recognize that with the way her clothes were arranged and disheveled, that she'd most likely been sexually assaulted and that she needed immediate medical attention. Kathy was rushed to the hospital, but she died en route. Kathy had several major lacerations on her head. We believe it to be the weapon was found um, near Kathy's body. The weapon was a fence post. It was approximately two to two and a half feet long, from what I believe. Detective Finney came onto the phone and told me that my mom had died. Next thing I remember, I uh, kind of lost control, and I think I yelled at uh, Detective Finney for a little bit. Although Kathy was using her cell phone when the attack occurred, investigators couldn't find it anywhere in the area near her body. When police checked her cell phone records, they discovered someone had used her cell phone after her murder. One of the numbers called when a person told us that a subject, uh, Juan Sanchez, uh, had called them. Investigators tracked 23-year-old Juan Sanchez to his residence and there, they found Kathy's cell phone in his possession. But Sanchez claimed he found the phone on the jogging path. He explained to us that he was riding his bike on the canal trail. And while he was riding his bike, he found the cell phone. He decided to use it for his personal use. Sanchez showed police exactly where he found the phone. Remarkably. It was just 50 feet from Kathy's body. There was only one individual in our minds who could have had that cell phone, and that would have been the individual who attacked Kathy. But Sanchez denied he was the killer and denied seeing the blood on the trail near the cell phone. Investigators knew right away this would not be a routine murder investigation. This was shocking. We're talking about a woman close to her office going for a walk on a trail frequented by many people in broad daylight. And to have this kind of thing happen to her, it would be like being struck by lightning. Family, friends, and even police were stunned by the sheer audacity of Kathy Lorick's murder. I was shocked that something like that happened because I've never seen any sign of 
anything like this going on, you know. I still want to walk, you know. I don't want to be intimidated to stop and change my routine. For this attack to occur on a beautiful sunny day with a lot of people who realistically could have been around the, the incident at the time it occurred, it's pretty brazen and you know pretty bold on the, on the part of the suspect. An encampment of several dozen homeless people just a quarter mile from the trail meant a random attack was a real possibility. Now, there'd been concerns about transients and homeless people on that trail previously, and a lot of folks felt it just wasn't safe to go out on that trail. But that wasn't the only possibility. There are numerous access and exit points to this canal trail, either by the public roadways, by individuals using adjacent fields, and access gates. The murder weapon was a broken piece of metal fencing. This perpetrator actually broke off a piece of metal fence post, and it appears that they waited for her to return from her walk and then dragged her off the trail. There was blood, but no prints on the murder weapon. Kathy's autopsy confirmed that she'd been sexually assaulted. The DNA profile from Kathy Lorick's rape kit didn't match any in the statewide DNA database of known criminal offenders. It didn't match Juan Sanchez, the man who found Kathy's cell phone, either. He appeared to be very truthful to us. He didn't have any trouble answering our questions. And he volunteered to take a, a voice stress analyzer test, which he took and, and passed. It was very disheartening uh, to find out that the cell phone didn't lead to any place in particular. In a search for suspects, police rounded up everyone who was on or near the trail at the time of the murder. Some were homeless people. Others were joggers and bikers. About a half dozen of them told a story that was remarkably consistent. They had seen a male standing at the fence line looking into the canal and talking about the little fishes in the canal and drawing this to the attention of people that were walking by. And this person seemed like they were out of place. He was a white male, uh, maybe six feet tall, maybe early 30s, a kind of heavy set, not muscular, but maybe a little bit overweight, brownish blonde hair, and disheveled. Some of the people described him as possibly transient or homeless. Two of these potential witnesses were sent to police sketch artist Gil Zamora. And I asked them the question, if you saw him again, would you recognize him? They say yes, then I, I know that I can draw the sketch. With each witness, Zamora tried to induce a state of deep relaxation, and then had them describe what they saw. I asked them to kind of tell me what they were doing right before they met the person, and then kind of go through the entire process of the meeting or the event, and then up until police get involved. Eventually, these two drawings emerged from witnesses who had never spoken with each other. Except for the sunglasses, the sketches were virtually identical. They were two independent witnesses, and they did not know each other. I think these witnesses both saw the same person. Then police got a huge break. Investigators using K-9 teams identified a potential lead. They were able to track a scent trail to a residential area in Concord that was very close to the, the canal trail. A background check revealed a man living in this neighborhood had a criminal history. He also looked similar to the composite drawings. His name was Mark Fisher. He was known to be violent, violent to his relatives, violent to police officers and to other public officials. Witnesses in the park were shown a photo lineup which included Fisher's picture. At least three of the witnesses were positive that the photo of Mr. Fisher was the subject they had seen on the trail. But when investigators went to Fisher's house, they got some shocking news. The police were met by a relative who told them, you haven't heard? My brother, Mr. Fisher, just killed himself, uh, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, committed suicide. 
Mark Fisher killed himself less than 24 hours after Kathy's murder. This person now kills himself a day after uh, this type of crime. Um, there are no coincidences like that. You know, it just doesn't happen in my experience. It was our belief that after the assault, that he felt remorse, that he felt guilt, and he just couldn't live with what he had done. A search of Fisher's room seemed to confirm his role in the murder. We found a pair of sunglasses, similar to the type of sunglasses seen in the sketch. They seized some clothing that appeared to have blood stains on it and noticed that a, a newspaper uh, in the house was open to an article about the murder and a picture of the suspect sketch was there as well. The circumstantial evidence clearly pointed to Mark Fisher as the killer. But would the forensic evidence agree? Police were certain Mark Fisher was the man who sexually assaulted and murdered Kathy Lorick along the jogging trail. Police sniffer dogs tracked the killer's trail right to his front door. Several eyewitnesses chose his picture from a photo lineup, and it appeared he committed suicide just as police were about to arrest him. After Fisher's suicide, Scientists took a DNA sample in the morgue and compared Fisher's DNA profile to the biological evidence from Kathy Lorick's rape test kit. Shockingly, it didn't match. We strongly believe that Mark Fisher was responsible for Kathy's death. All of a sudden, he's not. What that means to us is that we have an individual that's still out walking about who can do this again, and that this individual is free. It basically put us back to ground zero, and we had to start over again. With a killer still on the loose, investigators instituted a DNA dragnet of all the homeless men in the area who had a violent criminal history. We began contacting everybody that used the trail, all the transients that we knew of. A total of 42 DNA profiles were tested against the killer's DNA. This was actually, in fact, the most reference samples that I had ever tested, that the laboratory had ever tested. But there were no hits. Then, nine days after the murder, investigators got a potential break. A mountain biker called police to say he recognized the man in the composite sketch. He'd seen him on the jogging trail on the day of Kathy's murder. Hey, dude, can I get one of those? Sure. He said the man asked him for a cigarette, and they had a short chat, although he didn't know his name. The mountain biker smoked one cigarette, and this other man who he was talking to smoked two cigarettes. Investigators asked the mountain biker to show them where this happened. It was within maybe 200 yards of the crime scene, and he pointed right to the ground and said, those are the cigarettes that we were smoking. But nine days had passed, and analysts were skeptical about getting DNA. Certainly, if it's been sitting outside, if it's been exposed to UV light or rain or mud or dirt, the longer it's been sitting out in the elements, the harder it would be to develop a DNA profile. But the cyclist did provide an important piece of information. He said the man told him he worked as a telemarketer in nearby Walnut Creek. A background check revealed there was only one telemarketing firm in Walnut Creek. The manager immediately told me that you're looking for Robert Frazier. He'd gotten into some trouble. He had committed some robberies. He had spent time in prison. He had committed some very violent assaults in prison and uh, out on the street. He was uh, a drifter, may have spent time in the Chicago area, in Indiana as well, as well as uh, Contra Costa County in California. Frazier's co-worker said he looked like the composite sketch. However, they said he'd quit his job around the time of Kathleen Lorick's murder. Police visited Frazier's last known address and found his ex-girlfriend. She said Frazier left town and she hadn't seen him since. I think he left town. But Frazier's girlfriend had a parting gift for police, Frazier's toothbrush. 
they hoped it would be the forensic answer they were looking for. Police now had a suspect in the sexual assault and murder of Kathy Lorick, Robert Frazier. But he'd left the area shortly after the murder, and they had no idea where he'd gone. Investigators had cigarette butts that they thought were used by Frazier while on the jogging trail the day of the murder. But they'd been exposed to the elements for nine days before police recovered them. I really felt that if that could happen to this victim, that could happen to anyone. So I felt that I really wanted to do my best in working hard on this case to help catch this individual. Fortunately for the scientists, it hadn't rained on the cigarette butts, and they were able to generate a DNA profile and compare it to Kathy's rape test kit. The person who had smoked the cigarettes was Kathy's killer. Scientists then compared the DNA on the cigarettes to the DNA on Frazier's toothbrush. Unfortunately, the toothbrush actually contained DNA from um, at least three individuals, male and female DNA. Once I was able to actually see that within that mixture, Fraser's DNA was on there, I, you know, of course I was excited. Perhaps most important, scientists also discovered Fraser's DNA from skin cells on the bloody fence post found near Kathy's body. Finding Robert's DNA on that fence post, which was the murder weapon, was very important because it showed that Robert was the one responsible for Kathy's death. The DNA evidence established a credible eyewitness who saw the uh, murderer in person on the day of the crime at the location of the crime scene. But where was Robert Frazier? Well, you know, murder investigations typically don't proceed in a linear fashion. Police subsequently uh, entered Mr. Frazier's name into the uh, National uh, Criminal Offender Database known as NCIC and discovered that he was being held uh, on a criminal charge in the state of Indiana. He was actually arrested for some sort of traffic infraction, and it was learned that he was on probation and that his probation officer um, was looking for him. California police immediately flew to Indiana to question Frazier. He seemed to be very cooperative, not nervous at all like you would expect somebody in that circumstance. He talked about being religious of some sort, in, in some sort of way. Frazier admitted he heard about Kathy Lorick's murder on television. You ever seen her picture on, t on TV? Yeah. yeah. What, what did she look like, do you remember? But Frazier slipped revealing a piece of information only the killer would know. She had long hair, it looked like it was brown. And freckled. <laughs> I don't know. How did you know she had freckled? Because I could see her on the TV. She's got a 43 inch screen. <laughs> you wear makeup, you can see it on the picture. Yeah, yes you can. It wasn't until investigators told Frazier they found his DNA on the murder weapon and on Kathy Lorick's rape test kit that Frazier changed his story. The only thing Robert was able to come up with is, well, maybe he was down there in the tree line area where Kathy's body was found previously and that he had urinated in the area, and that would be the only way. Prosecutors believe Kathy was walking along the jogging path, talking to her husband on her cell phone when Frazier first saw her. Prosecutors think Frazier chose Kathy as his victim because he saw no one nearby in either direction. Then he struck her with a piece of a metal fence post. He quickly dragged her from the jogging trail down the ravine, where he sexually assaulted her. Afterwards, he struck her several more times in the head and left her for dead. Thanks to the incredible accuracy of the eyewitness accounts, 
a superb composite drawing, and the chance meeting with a cyclist, Frazier left plenty of forensic evidence behind. I still don't understand why it happened. There really hasn't been a, a why. He never showed any remorse, and that, that's a real sense of frustration and anger that, you know, that this person just didn't care about another human being. And you wonder how anybody could be that way. Robert Frazier was tried and convicted of first-degree murder and rape. He was sentenced to death. In, in my opinion, he's the lowest person in, uh, that you can be. He is a, he doesn't deserve to breathe another breath in this life. He doesn't. He, t he took so much away from us and he needs to pay. I think uh, Robert Ward Frazier, for lack of a better term, is a monster. I don't know how he became a monster. And frankly, I, it doesn't matter to me how he became a monster. And the DNA is what solved this crime. If this crime had happened 30 years ago, Robert Ward Frazier would have got away with it.